<laughs> recording now good morning everybody welcome uh to the february 3rd safe routes to school call uh for minnesota i can hardly believe that it is already 2023 and we're already all the way through january i know we didn't have a january call because um you know we wanted to give you all a good new year's time and a good break to be thinking about 2023 but really excited uh to see you all and to be here and um be starting February already. Wow. So um, I'll spend a minute just introducing the network. What is the Minnesota Safe Routes to School Network? We are a group of hundreds of dedicated professionals from many kinds of organizations and agencies across Minnesota that are, uh, that are advancing safe routes to school, walking, biking, rolling, uh, getting kids and their families uh, to school safely. Um, we're working together uh, to build skills in our communities, to be able to implement uh, those routes, uh, those partnerships, those programs, and make Minnesota a state where everybody, um, no matter their race, age, income level, ethnicity, all those things, um, can walk and bicycle on routes that are safe, comfortable, and convenient. Uh, we have a very full agenda today, um, so uh, very excited about it. I'm doing welcome um, and introductions. We have a big team of folks on the agenda today, which is really exciting. Um, we're first going to get a MnDOT update from Dave Cowan. Um, Max is, uh, on my team is going to give us a quick meetup survey reminder, and then we're going to have some legislative updates from Angela at Bike Min, um, and then I'm actually going to be uh, giving you some cliff notes from MJ Carpi on our team, who is at the Capitol right now. Uh, CJ is going to walk us through the fleet guide, um, and then we're going to hear a little bit from Joanne and Dustin about bike fleets in practice. What does it actually look like down in Rochester and Olmstead County? We'll have a little bit of time for breakouts, and then we'll move to closing. So uh, with that, I think I'm going to turn it over to Dave for everyone's favorite part of the call, the MnDOT update. That's a lot of pressure. <laughs> <clears throat> It was saying that I couldn't share because you were, but I think I should be able to do it now. Hey, folks, uh, Dave Cowan. I'm the Safe Routes to School Coordinator here at the Minnesota Department of Transportation. A couple of hopefully quick updates for you. One, I know a lot of folks uh, wrote in to say that they um, had to put off their winter walk to school days because of the extra frigid weather in some parts of Minnesota. Um, but some of you also actually did participate yesterday. Um, either way, I want to encourage you to send in pictures and stories to uh, yours truly by February 17th, to enter it in for the Golden Snow Boot Award, which is an annual award we give to the um, primest of prime um, winter walk to school day events. Uh, we, we hope that February 17th will give folks enough time, even if you put it off, to still be able to send us um, you know, a brief story uh, from your winter walk to school day event, uh, as well as a photo, and you can send those to uh, my email address, dave.cowan, um, that I'll drop in the chat actually later to give you the rest of it. Uh, Joanne, I did maybe cheat and give you the, the microphone two times here. I wondered, these are some pictures from down at Gage Elementary in Rochester yesterday. Um, for their winter walk to school day event that they really went big with and john would you mind saying like three sentences about your event because i just think uh, the photos do speak a lot of words but sure we did it at one school um gage elementary in in um, rochester and uh, we had some partners there we uh, had kids from the walking school bus start out they stopped at the fire station along the way um, and then we met up with a, another bunch of kids on a corner and walked with um, the Grizzly hockey team. And then at school, we had this, um, Dustin and I set up a little tunnel for the kids, mm. for pedestrians to walk through. And then they got little treats uh, at the- I love the tunnel. I'm okay. stealing that idea for the front of my house. <laughs> <laughs> Um, wasn't, so these are, wasn't sorry, go ahead. For us. We did all right. Wasn't, love to hear it. Love to hear it. Hardy down there in Rochester. Um, well, thanks for, thanks for sharing a little bit, Joanne, about your event. Please, again, uh, if your events have been uh, rescheduled, send us after, uh, for those of you that have planned for next Wednesday. Um, and then a couple of updates on some of the solicitations that we had in, held in the fall. 
first of which is our planning assistance solicitation. Um, those applications are being reviewed right now by our review committees. Uh, but we received 18 different applications from communities across the state. We expect to have about $400,000 in funding available. Um, so we'll see how far down the list that's able to fund once we prioritize that. And we expect to have those decisions um, out to folks by uh, the end of February, so just in a few short weeks. Um, however, that work doesn't really begin until July of 2023. Um, so more to come on that by our next uh, network call, we hope, and we'll share that then. Uh, we also, because we didn't have a January call, didn't have uh, much of a public announcement around the results of our Safe Frost to School Boost implementation grant solicitation. Uh, we did see applications from across the state and awarded uh, these, I think it's 11, um, I'm trying to do a quick count, 11 different communities for various boost grants, um, one of which ended up backing out. So ultimately we funded 10 different communities uh, the list here is over on the left, and it's everything really from, from bike fleets and trailers to bike racks and, and programming and all of these various communities. We're excited to see what comes of that. And something that we've been learning maybe the hard way over the past few years is that our solicitation cycle doesn't work well with the biennium funding that comes for the Safe Routes to School program. And it puts us in the situation that we were in this year where we um, have only a few short months to spend those grant funds and it makes up uh, the second year of the biennium hard to do anything that, uh, that includes any kind of programming, whether that's walking school bus leaders or safe routes coordinators or otherwise. Um, so we are making uh, an adjustment to our solicitation schedule. So I hope your ears are perking up as we're talking about bike fleets today. Um, we are going to hold our booth solicitation uh, solic solicitation um, in spring, uh, starting this spring of 2023. So yes, we did just close this boost solicitation and we are making awards. We're gonna start, we're going to shift our scheduling for this uh, starting here in 2023 to hold these um, in the spring. And the way that'll look like in terms of the timeline is March 1st, that application will open back up again. Um, we'll have webinars during that month uh, to, if you've never applied for a grant before, you're trying to think about how to how to shape your boost grant um, and then those applications will be due by May 17th which should get us in a position to have communities that are awarded with contracts by the beginning of the school year uh, which gives them much more time to implement um, and better aligns with what is going on um, in school districts and schools around the state. I will have more information about that coming soon but I wanted to get in your ears uh, here in February so that uh, you could start planning for the spring if you are interested in um, implement, program implement, implementation funds for your safe process school work. And then Kelly and I were both pretty uh, happy to hear, we talked to, with the Minnesota Twins just a few weeks ago to find out that they have um, you know, special deals for uh, student safety patrol and crossing guard appreciation days. Uh, so the days that are listed on here are their official school patrol days. If you're working uh, in a school district or a set of schools that have school patrols at work or are using crossing guards, um, they are offered discount tickets to these various twin games. And um, the twins are working on how they'll um, highlight and appreciate the students and adults for helping people get to and from school safely at their games uh, and are hopefully going to tell us exactly what that's going to look like here in the coming weeks. But um, if you have any interest in, in bringing this to your communities, uh, Ryan's email is on, on the slide right now um, and phone number. And I think he gives batches of tickets at these discount prices to uh, school patrol and crossing guards. And that's all I got this week or this month, Alyssa. Thanks, Dave. Maybe it's just because like I'm a nerd who's applied to a lot of grants, but I am so excited about the news about the timing <laughs> shift. Uh, <laughs> that feels really big. So uh, really glad that you're able to share with that with us early enough that folks can start thinking about what are they going to apply for in May. Um, with that, um, I will give Max the floor for two minutes uh, to talk about the meetup survey reminder. <laughs> 
Hello, everyone. Um, for those who weren't introduced to me, I'm filling in for Julie today as she is at the Capitol. Uh, but she was very clear that she'd like you all to take this survey um, that I just dropped in the chat. Um, and actually, I can do it again without the extra text. So hopefully it hyperlinks. But it is for a meetup in the summer. Um, Julie will probably be there. I will probably not um, because I'm filling in. But uh, we hope you take the survey. We hope you fill it out. And um, that's all I know about it. We want to get you all together, right? So we need your feedback. Thanks, Max. Um, with that, uh, we'll spend just a minute or two here on some legislative updates. Um, uh, Angela, I'll kick it over to you first, and then I'll add a couple things at the end. Just wanting to make sure that as the state legislature is in session right now, um, that you all have a sense of um, what we as advocate organizations are pushing for at the state capitol. So. Yeah, thanks, Alyssa. So hi, everyone. I'm Angela Olson. I use she her pronouns, and I am the education director at the Bicycle Alliance. I'll just talk for a minute um, about some of our kind of legislative agenda. I just put the link in the chat for um, the agenda that we have listed on our website. Just a couple of important things to highlight that are on there. Um, one is a omnibus bill named after um, Bill Dooley, who was a close friend of the Bike Alliance and board member, chair of the advocacy committee who recently passed away. So this is like a pretty comprehensive policy funding bill. Um, and it includes bunch of things in there, but two things that I want to highlight are um, there's a standalone provision that's also a part of this bill that would kind of change some of the language about what schools are required to um, provide in terms of transportation education. So right now, um, there's a mandated bus safety education bill, but we're proposing changing the language that talks about cycling and pedestrians from may teach to must teach. So that's um, kind of a big part of this bill. And then also um, increasing MnDOT's base budget from 1.5 million to 10 million and, and increase the active transportation program to 25 million. So we're asking for a lot of dollars, a lot of money, um, but we're hoping that some of these um, changes will really help us be able to serve the mission of safe routes um, and all the great work that we're able to do about it. A couple other things, you know, um, there's another, uh, there's an e-bike rebate program that we're supporting. We're also supporting, I'm sure Alyssa will talk a little bit about it, but um, the Metro sales tax for transit, um, as well as the bicycle safety stop, which is also known as the Idaho stop or um, stop is yield. So take a look at our website if you are interested in learning more or talking to some people about some of these, um, some of this legislative agenda. The bicycle summit, bike walk summit is coming up next week. So you can come, you can talk to some of the people um, in power, <laughs> kind of lobby and get some more information and kind of advocate for some of the things we're talking about. We'll also be testifying, actually I'll be testifying next week on specifically the May to Must portion of the omnibus bill and also the increase in MnDOT's uh, baseline budget. So. Yeah, if you have any questions, feel free to ask us. I'm happy to talk more about it, but um, I wanted to be sure to highlight those those things coming up. Yeah. Thanks, Angela, and thanks, Kelly, for the link in the chat. Um, I'll add a couple other things. So Move Minnesota as an advocacy organization is um, focused largely on transit, but also um, some other sustainable active transportation, walking and biking. Like Angela mentioned, one of the big things that we're pushing for at the Capitol this year is um, kind of increasing the dependable long-term funding for the Metro Transit system and for transit across the state in greater Minnesota. Um, there's a couple different things that we are uh, advocating for as far as like the, the technical way we pay for those things. One of them is that 1% Metro area sales tax. Um, which would have that long-term dedicated funding for transit in the metro area. We're also working um, to, I think this is probably the thing that is most relevant for <laughs> folks on this call, um, push for um, a, there's a, we have a, a, a word or a phrase that we use all the time uh, in our state, highway purposes. Um, and we are pushing to have uh, highway purposes be inclusive of walking, biking, and transit so that 
uh, folks in greater Minnesota communities where you're like downtown main streets are often things that are designated highways um, that you would be able to in those corridors spend those funds on walking biking and transit improvements uh, as well so we also have a couple other things that we are advocating for here at the local level transit ambassador program um, in the twin cities to to make the transit experience more welcoming decriminalizing fare non-payment um, but those are those are a little more local than than some of that highway purposes work that we're doing that will be um, will have impacts across the state so again cliff notes uh, but just wanted to make sure folks were aware of of some of the things that we're talking about and pushing for uh, both so that um, you know for your own knowledge but if you have folks that you're working with in your community families who really want to get involved in certain kinds of advocacy um, that that you have some information to be able to share out with them. So uh, with that, I think we'll, to keep us on time, I will move us on from the advocacy update because we have a pretty packed agenda for the rest of the call today. I'm going to turn it over to CJ to uh, walk us through the bike fleet guide. Um, and we'll hopefully spend uh, about 10 minutes or so on that. Um, and then we'll turn it over to the folks from Rochester. All right, thanks, Alyssa, and hopefully you all are looking at my screen. Um, great, and let's see, I'll jump into the slideshow, maybe. Maybe I won't. Um, here we go. So uh, my name is CJ Linder. I'm the Education Manager at the Bicycle Alliance. Um, I've been doing uh, Safe Routes work for about 10 years now and excited to be um, sharing with you some of the resources we have. Um, hopefully this is not brand new information. However, uh, we have been making some updates recently. Um, well, we kind of always are continuous improvement. Um, our curriculum just went through a major overhaul where we doubled the number of lessons. So we're um, making wanting to make sure that folks know that that has happened and um, to reach out to teachers who are currently using the, the lessons or would like to be using them. Um, there's a lot of new material in there and um, we're happy to come around and do training. We've also got um, technical assistance services so we can uh, come out to the schools and help teachers to deliver these lessons to be more prepared. One of the things that we consistently hear um, from teachers that in order to be successful with these lessons, it's important to have access to equipment, bikes and helmets and things. Um, so that's no surprise. The Bike Alliance. Okay, has, sorry, I'm uh, gonna I'm gonna interrupt because I think I'm not sure if, if this is true for other folks, but I'm seeing a big black screen that just says loading oh, instead of your PowerPoint, and I um, I don't know if you want to try turn turning it on and off again like we do with all the technological <laughs> technological things. We can see it when you're not presenting though. So okay. like right now we can see it, CJ. So um, hmm, maybe I'll stay out of presenter mode. Sorry about that. I think when I go into presenter mode, it puts it on a different screen or something. Um, oh, that's too much. All right. Well, we'll just look at it a little bit smaller. I hope that's okay for folks. I think that's great. Thanks, CJ. Okay. Thanks for uh, catching me on that. So that you weren't continuing to see just a blank screen. Um, so today I just wanted to share a, a in uh, real quickly what some of those resources look like, including specifically the fleet guide, as well as uh, how to request access to the shared fleets that we already have. Um, so the, the main thing that we want people to know about is how to find these resources. The simplest way is to navigate um, to the website, walkbikefund.org backslash fleets is the handy shortcut. Um, that takes you both to the fleet request form as well as um, the form to download uh, the fleet guide. And the fleet guide is I'm going to talk a little bit more about is basically a resource for folks that are interested in managing their own bike fleets. Um, so the next couple of slides are going to have a lot of print and tiny font. Um, please don't worry about trying to read every word on the screen, but just to give an idea of what some of the, the content in the fleet guide is. Um, so we start out with sort of like a background project goals. If you're putting together a boost grant, for example, this might be a really useful starting point. Um, get you considering what uh, your aims are for having a bike fleet. Um, we talk about some of the considerations that you would uh, want to think through about designing your fleet program. Um, so things like how many buildings are you trying to serve with this? How many total students? What are the age ranges? Um, all of those things are going to inform 
what ultimately you end up needing to do for your fleet program. Um, obviously, one of the biggest things is where to get bikes from. So there's a whole section on kind of the recommendations around what specification you want on the bikes, as well as some ideas about where to source those from um, and some funding suggestions. Um, so if you're not getting uh, your funding all from one source, like the Department of Transportation, there are still other options. Um, so there's a section on that. Uh, and then it goes into a little bit more logistics. Um, so sections on uh, ideas for storing and transporting. Um, a popular solution has been an enclosed trailer. Um, that's what we use. That allows both for storage and mobility um, to move around. So that's been a convenient option. Um, and there's a bunch of these around the state now. Some detail around building that trailer out. Um, so Cirrus actually helped us to design the schematic around how to maximize the space and in inside of the trailer um, and also be easy and convenient for folks to use. Um, a little bit more detail on managing that. So, you know, scheduling, um, checkout procedures, things like that, um, a section suggestions around here. Um, I know that each district and each organization is gonna be a little bit unique in terms of their needs and things, um, so wh whether that's like requiring waivers or um, you know, insurance for drivers, things like that. So there's not, there's not only one right way um, that things can be done. Um, and this guide tries to capture sort of um, the considerations that you would face and some ideas for um, addressing those. Um, you might need some other supplies in your bike fleet. So it's not just bikes, helmets, cones, vests, chalk, things like that to actually set up the lessons and do the activities, um, as well as maintaining the bike fleet. Even if you are fortunate enough to receive a boost grant, um, the ongoing maintenance is always something that um, folks have to solve on their own. Um, the funding doesn't extend beyond, um, you know, that first year of funding and, and you, you hope to have the bikes for many years. Um, so how do you keep them working, keep them going? Um, some of that you can do your own, some of that you probably will outsource, but this section kind of talks through some of those things to think about. Um, we've got some forms, some samples to use. So if insurance liability is a concern, um, there's some ideas in here around how you might address that, um, as well as a whole appendix of other stuff. So um, that's kind of what's in the guide. Um, here's a, a slide, a snapshot from a few years ago about um, activities and other fleets around the state. Um, this is, uh, this is yeah, like I said, a snapshot several years ago. So as you can imagine, we've been to more places and more fleets have been continued to be added to the system, which is awesome. Um, our goal as an organization is that um, eventually every student in Minnesota would have access to this bike education and those fleets are a crucial part of that success. Um, so really happy for, um, for MnDOT to be continuing this awesome program and supporting the capacity for communities across the state to get involved. Um, in the meantime, while you um, may not have a fleet of your own to use, we've got uh, several shared fleets at this point. Um, we've got two that we're programming right now, as well as a third that we're setting up for um, lessons for younger students. Um, so our curriculum now includes learn to ride activities for students in grades K through two. Um, those are gonna obviously require a little bit different bikes than the eighth graders are using, for example. So we're um, in the process of getting that fleet set up and that'll be programmed this spring. Um, and again, the link to all of that information, walkbikefund.org backslash fleets. Um, I can say that our current spring season is mostly filled up, especially for the prime weeks in the middle of May, uh, but we do still have availability um, earlier in the season as well as later. So if you are um, willing to roll the dice on an early snow melt, um, you can submit the a request form for April, um, or if your school's in session after Memorial Day, um, we've got openings for them as well. Um, and the summer too can be a great time for programming, understanding that schools are out of session, but there's other youth serving organizations and activities that may be able to take advantage of using bikes. Um, and we're more than happy to support that as well. So that's really what I've got to share today. Um, contact information's on the screen, happy to take any questions or we can keep the call moving, um, but that's all I got.
Awesome. Thank you, CJ. I do see a couple questions in the chat that I'll, I'll ping. So one of, one of them is uh, pretty straightforward. Our folk, can you, can you share the slides? If, uh, are we okay with us sending slides out to the folks who are on the call today? Alyssa, this is Angela. I just shared the link to download our fleet guide and that's where all of the information I believe um, in the slideshow is from. So uh, well, I, hopefully Shell, who asked the question, can take a look at it. And if there's any other questions about that, uh, let us know. Um, there was also a question from somebody who jump, jumped off, and it's not really quite framed as a question, um, but about training needs for uh, people who would like to reserve the fleet who aren't schools. Is there anything that you would want to say about that? Um, yeah, I can speak to that briefly. Um, we do require that people uh, res who reserve the fleet have been through a Walk Like Fun training and are using the bikes for Walk Like Fun bike education. Um, that being said, there's no cost to that training and we are able to offer instructor stipends or substitute teacher reimbursement um, if you're missing class time on a school day. Um, historically, we've had about 60% of uh, educators working in schools um, who've completed the training, which means that about 40% of the educators we've trained are, are not um, regular classroom teachers. So that can be anything from, you know, community serving organizations, law enforcement officers, public health folks. Um, it, it absolutely does not need to be um, a licensed school teacher to partake in the training and then reserve the bikes. Awesome. Thank you. Um, uh, follow up question Do they need to have the updated walk bike fund training if they've been trained previously? Uh, for right now, as long as they've been through a version of the training, they are considered qualified. Um, whether and when that changes at some point in the future has not been decided yet. But right now, if you completed the training, you are good to go. Awesome. Great news. Thanks, CJ. Well, that is it for questions in the chat right now. I'll pause for just a second before we transition on to see if there's anybody else who's like in the process of typing a thing up. Uh, but really appreciate you, CJ, walking folks th through the guide. I know um, it can be uh, when you when you end up with like a really de text dense guide with a lot of information in it, having a walkthrough before folks dig in can be really, really helpful. So thank you. Alyssa, can I ask a question? Go for it, Sarah. Um, CJ, do you have, um like examples or ideas of how people manage adaptive bike fleets or like move those around is like a trailer also the best way to do that or I, I yeah something we're thinking about yeah um that's a great question Sarah and I don't want to uh, get too off track on that um we we kind of do it in a couple ways so we've got adaptive bikes that we include with our standard bike fleets those are um, for the most part like recumbent trike style adaptive bikes um, and the reason for that is that those we find serve the widest variety of physical mobility needs. Um, separately, we are operating um, what we call the Adaptive Bike Library Program. And that is functionally a little bit different from the, the fleets in that the, the time um, reservation for that is significantly longer. Uh, the bike fleets we typically assign for one to two weeks at a time in order to keep um, those moving between schools and allow as many people as possible to access those. Uh, by contrast, the adaptive equipment that we've got, and I saw Angela mentioned in the chat, uh, we've got nine total pieces, um, not including the Strider bikes, um, of different adaptive bike equipment. And we're checking those out for anywhere from one to three months, um, kind of based on the need as well as the demand. Um, and so I guess for transporting those, um, we, we do a variety of things. Um, sometimes it works to use the trailer, but more often we're using our large cargo van, um, or sometimes we use a third party um, shipping service to, to send those bikes around the state. Awesome. Thank you, CJ. Um, I think if folks have other questions for CJ, put those in the chat, but I wanna make sure that Joanne and Dustin have lots of time to share uh, their experience about what is it like to have a bike fleet in reality? Um, I will note, I'm probably gonna pivot us away from small group discussions just cause we're running long on time and I wanna make sure that we have lots of time to, to go through this. So um, with mm -hmm. that, I will turn it over to Joanne and to Dustin. Thanks so much. All right, are you able to see my screen? Looks great. Okay. 
Well, good morning. Um, I'm Joanne Judge Dietz. I work with Olmstead County Public Health and the SHIP Grant, and I'm going to be presenting with Dustin Morrow, who is our Safe Rest School, School Coordinator at the Rochester Public Schools. So I'm going to go a little bit on our history and some of the uh, fleets that we currently have in Olmstead County, and then Dustin's going to tell you about our, our newest um, fleet that is ready to launch. So in Olmstead County, we have a lot of different fleets. We have a lot of different funding sources. Most of our fleets are independent at one site and they're not shared. Um, and so right now we're trying to handle how to create a more equitable, a sustainable plan across the school sites. So we've learned a lot of different things about, um, about bike fleets. Um, one of them is that it's not just about the bikes and uh, CJ just mm -hmm. talked a little bit about that. Um, a lot of it is, is that oversight beyond a single teacher, having an ongoing plan, having a budget for maintenance. And then of course, just having bikes doesn't mean that you automatically know how to take care of them. Um, thinking about storage, transportation, uh, constantly recruiting new teachers to do walk bike fund training. Um, and then just thinking about how we can get access to all kids in the district. So this is one of our first fleets and Kelly Carbon might be uh, familiar with these because she got these set up with a grant that we had from, uh, it was federal grant, uh, community, uh, CPPW grant, Communities Putting Prevention to Work. So this um, was two styles of bikes uh, for middle school and high school kids size ranges. This is pictured here as a cruiser style bike with pedal brakes. And then they were also paired with smaller BMX hand uh, handbrake bikes. The teachers really preferred these cruiser bikes because they are so simple uh, to operate and to maintain. Kids definitely preferred the BMX style bikes because they could go faster and they could do wheelies, which was another reason that the teachers liked the cruisers better. Um, but both the teachers and the students just love the bike program. Um, maintenance for these um, um, issue right from the very beginning because they really didn't have the skills to keep them up. So eventually we got volunteers uh, in the community to come and help them on an annual basis to, to do the upkeep with the fleets. Um, we had two elementary schools, Longfellow and Riverside, that wanted to start their own fleets. And so they started with, they started small, each got about a dozen bikes and they used them in after school programs. And then they realized um, that they really wanted to move it into PE. So, but they didn't have enough bikes because they only had uh, about a dozen. And so they, um, they got together, uh, shared their partial fleets and now they're able to teach a bike unit in school in PE. Um, because they both kind of got their bikes separately, they really didn't think about the equity piece or the beginner, beginner bikes, so they didn't have any strider bikes, they didn't have any adaptive um, options. And they also had kind of some sketchy um, storage, so all of the bikes last, all of the helmets last year had to be replaced because of mold. Um, so some issues along the way. Also, um, they they don't have the, a trailer, so they have to do like an open trailer within the district or personal vehicles to do multiple um, trips back and forth. And then just by happenstance, um, we um, accumulated some bikes from because the nice ride program in Rochester was transitioned to a scooter program. So we wanted those bikes to maintain to keep, stay in the community. So uh, 40 of them went to one of the high schools. So they got 40 bikes, helmets, and a fix-it station. And they don't use these in PE, they use them in a sports biology class. Um, so they go on all their field trips with on bike. So the kids are really learning transportation uh, by bike, not just recreation. So that is exciting. These bikes are being phased out. So maintenance is a little bit of an issue just getting the parts for them. <clears throat> Rochester Community Ed is really big in Rochester. They run a school age childcare program across all of the 17 schools, elementary schools. And then they run a large summer program with 300 kids at three different sites. So for several years, CJ came down and did um, fun bike days at all of the sites. 
And um, the director who is pictured here which loved it. And he just wanted to move it from a one day event to really using bikes all the time, all summer. And so he planned to get his own fleet trailer. Um, he sent all his lead staff to Wi Fi Fund training. And then he had Wi Fi Fund come down for a couple of years in a row to do an ambassador program for all their summer counselors, which are usually high school students. Um, and because they had the, those years of experience working with with the program, they saw what they needed. They right off the bat had um, adaptive bikes and beginner bikes. They also are a fee for service program, and so they have funding to maintain their program and to do the maintenance. Uh, this is Dobriota, one of our rural elementary schools. So they got a, a fleet back um, with Kelly back in the early days in 2010. Um, they teach bike in bike education both in fourth grade and fifth grade PE, and then at the end of fifth grade, they go on a multi-day uh, trip for science down to Lanesboro, and then they use the bikes. They bring the bikes with them on in their trailer and use the bikes on the trail. And the kids know that it's an incentive; they love it. And um, they also use these bikes in their summer rec program. They have a bike club. So anybody that doesn't have their own bike can use the uh, school fleet. Um, you'll notice that the, the kids also are wearing um, a cross sport helmet. So they use these, um, they use their money very well. So they got um, bikes, uh, helmets that can, they can use in their inline skating unit also. And they take good care of this. It's really a, a community asset. So they contract with a mobile bike mechanic to do all their maintenance. This is Stewartville, another small uh, district, rural, south of Rochester. And their trailer is right on the corner of that uh, first picture. Um, they do bike education in fifth grade at their middle school. And the bikes that are here are, this is their bike rack. And... Um, so what I love about this is that this is what bike education can do for a school. Um, love it. I mean, it was it was bike to school day. I will admit, doesn't look like that every day. Um, this uh, one of the things right off the bat that we saw that we kind of um, didn't prepare for was that the need for adaptive bikes and beginner bikes um, at all of the sites. So um, we had to catch up. So we bought a couple of fleets for one fleet for the adaptive PE teachers for high school, the center picture there for the low riders, and then for the elementary school. Um, some of those stay on site and some of them are moved around to where the kids are who need them. One of the things that I love about this is that they use these bikes as a reward for the kids for their free time in addition to PE. And so if you know anything about kids with special needs, a lot of times they are rewarded with food. And so this is just a great uh, way to reward the kids with physical activity and they love them. Then um, when we were looking at the adaptive bikes, we really thought, wow, these are really expensive. We need to find a way to have bikes that are shared better. And so we looked at our partners for um, Rochester Park and Rec and they have a large program for adults in the community, 18 and up, for exceptional abilities. So we had an open house for the public, um, for them to look at all of the different kinds of adaptive bikes, because for every adaptation there is, there's a different style of bike. So um, what they came up with was the low riders, which are about three of those, and then two side-by-side -side adaptive bikes. And then very shortly after that, um, we got a request for this trailer that attaches on the back of the um, adaptive, the tandem, so that four people can ride. And what was really helpful was just knowing how these are being used. In addition to the adaptive program during the week, they also check these out on the weekend for the public. And so when the public came, this is um, like a group home could use this, but they have one staff to three adults. Um, and so this way they could go, they could take everybody on a ride. So um, very well used, um, checked out a lot. Um, unfortunately, one of the uh, low riders um, biked off into the sunset. So they had to kind of look at their checkout system 
to make just tighten it up a little bit and get more information from the people who were renting them out. And then our last specialty fleet uh, is for the Rochester Pub, uh, Police Department. Um, they wanted to do a um, community action team to get out into the community a little bit more. And so they do some patrol on bike. Um, they use the bikes also to engage with kids. And so in addition to the bikes that are um, like fully uh, loaded, they got a trailer and that's filled with maintenance equipment. They go with us to all the priority communities, um, neighborhoods that we have and do um, bike rodeos with us. They are part of walk and bike to school days. And I know that a lot of communities have kind of severed their ties with law enforcement. They, re they really are good um, partners for us. Um, and so that's the last uh, specialty um, one that I'm going to talk about. I'm going to turn it over to Dustin, who's going to talk about our newest fleet that's ready to roll out. Good morning. Can everybody hear me? Good. Okay. So thank you, Joanne. I just want to talk about the newest fleet that we got. Um, it's a combination of some of the successes and failures of the past one. So we really wanted to narrow it down and make something that's sustainable for a large district in Rochester and really integrate it into the, into the district. So it's not something if my job goes away that it's just something that gets left behind. Um, it's going to be shared between all the elementary schools. So it's an elementary specific fleet and it's going to allow equitable access to uh, different bike programs. And the main target is going to be older students in elementary, fourth, fifth grade. Um, when we looked at that, third and below is kind of you're spending a lot more time on a lot of the basics versus like actually getting out and biking. So we really wanted to target the fourth and fifth grade to make it effective. Um, the bike fleet itself includes 32 bikes. 16 of them are, are these 18 inch nine bot bikes that are super adjustable. 16 are the 24 inch head bikes. <clears throat> and when I was looking at these, I, I made sure that there's like a, a good trade off between the 18 to 24. 18 is kind of a smaller bike, but the seats raise up so high. I can fit on six foot one, 200 pounds, and I can fit on that smaller bike. So it is super adjustable. The seat goes up and down quite a bit. The handlebars come up and down. Um, we got a couple balance bikes, two uh, turn adjustable bikes as well for the adults or uh, leaders of the group. And those, you can ride those from like seven foot all the way down to four foot. I mean, those are, they fold up, super adjustable. The helmets were a big thing that we saw were lacking with some of the other fleets because we, they're all elementary style helmets where some of the hair with like larger braids, larger hair, they need adult size helmets to fit. So we made sure to get small to extra large for the, that consideration. Um, maintenance is a big thing that we really wanted to, to take a hold of. So we have uh, grant funded maintenance that I received prior to this grant. So we already have maintenance equipment. And with this uh, fleet that we got, we made sure to write in maintenance, more maintenance equipment that will be kept with the trailer. And we have several partners that we're working with. Um, there's volunteers in education that are bike mechanics. We're working with a school, Friedel, which is a two-pronged approach. So we're training them in bike maintenance to be able to take care of the fleet. It's a, it's a middle school right fit. So they're super excited about being able to take something on. Um, students are getting trained in the bike maintenance. We're hoping to have uh, one of the local bike shops teach them and then uh, bike MN the bike alliance when they do their maintenance class down here we can uh, rope them into that as well so it's yeah it's a two-pronged approach so it's awesome we're getting to teach students and they will be maintaining the fleet as well it's going to have a full bike roadie equipment on it um, Olmsted county also i mean joanne helps with pretty much every um bike rodeo that we do so she always comes with stuff but there's also be a full set on there 
we got a 24 foot trailer like CJ was talking about. Um, it, it handles the storage, which is big for schools. There's no storage in the school. So having that and then to be able to keep the bike safe and mobile has been really helpful. Uh, the maintenance plan. So like I just kind of talked about, um, the teacher training is huge. A lot of the teachers that I talked to didn't have any training. There was no uh, tools. There was no, even for the basic type of stuff, they didn't have bike pumps for the tires. So that's something we really, we really wanted to, to make sure that we got taken care of with this. Uh, Hands-on experiences like we talked about. You can see in the picture on the left down there, that's students at Right Fit. They helped put together a couple bikes for us and some of the bike uh, bikes are in the back there as well. Um, we have several partnerships, which has been super helpful. Um, local bike groups, We Bike Rochester, which is a subsidiary of Bike MN. The management is under district control. So all the fleets fall under our control. Uh, the maintenance is supported by myself. So there's actually somebody who cares about the bike fleet away from the, the classroom. So the teachers aren't having to do all the extra maintenance or planning it, or, you know, just an extra thing that they have to do in, in with teaching. That was a big headache for teachers is they, they really want to know who's going to take care of the fleet, who's going to manage the maintenance. Um, the annual event with volunteer mechanics each summer. So that will take care of anything that's wrong with the bikes at the end of the year after heavy use, and then also get them ready for summer school classes and for the next fall. So to make sure we go through everything on those along with basic maintenance throughout the year. Uh, centralized storage which with our trailer is super nice. Um, I also have this classroom. I was given a classroom at middle school, right fit. So that houses all my maintenance equipment. Um, the students have access to it. Uh, volunteers in education come in. That's where I'll be teaching a lot of the maintenance classes that we do. We also have a couple of sheds that we got funded to hold the bikes. Um, the fleet management. We already kind of touched on that, but the trailer is going to provide that to both things, storage and transportation. We really want to make sure that the responsibility falls on the teacher and principal for the registration and the check-in, check-out. That was a big uh, issue with some of the other bikes. The teachers wouldn't you know, return the bikes in the same condition they got them. So we're going to make sure that there's a good check-in, check-out process just to hold them accountable and make sure that the bikes are ready for the next group. Um, we will have some requirements to use the fleet as well. Teacher training, we're going through that right now, working with Bike MN to get a, a, a training set up, a good check-in, check-out process, and a post-evaluation of the unit. Uh, Joanne and I talked about that, I mean, that's something that's super necessary with this fleet, just to be able to gather that feedback and really work with what the teachers want, what, what works well for the students and what's gonna be sustainable. And we're, we'll have a, uh, tags on the trailer as well that a teacher can just zip tie them or get them attached to each bike if they notice something wrong with them. And I think the, the biggest thing that I found is the communication piece of it. Um, just making sure that the teachers know that they're going to be supported. Uh, I think that's like it's part of what I'm going through right now is like some teachers are hesitant just based off of past experience and just letting them know that, you know, we're here to support them. I have a whole network of people that are going to be able to help them and it's not going to be just dumping bikes on them and hey, figure it out. So just making sure that they know that there's a plan set up and that you know, that they'll have that support. And that is me and Julianne. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, there's just so much of what you shared where I'm like, it mirrors so much my own experience, just even at an individual level of like having a bike, right? Like you get a flat tire and you're like, oh, I didn't, I don't have a bike pump. 
and then you leave your bike somewhere and it turns out your bike got rusty, right? Like all those sort of challenges that you experience at the individual level and trying to like maintain your own bike and then thinking about, you know, scaling those up to dozens and hundreds of bikes and figuring out how to transport them and all that stuff. It's just, they feel like, um, it's a lot, it's a lot to manage. So Alyssa, have you ever had a moldy helmet? <laughs> I have I have not had a moldy helmet. Uh, okay. No, no. <laughs> um, but I have had like rusty chains and flat tires and bikes where I don't have the spare parts that I need and all that stuff. So uh I know Joanne, you said something as we were kind of preparing uh at the beginning of the call about like, well, we've made all the mistakes, so we've learned all the lessons, and it just like that came through so clearly in your presentation. So um, I don't know if anybody has any uh, burning questions. I'm scrolling through the chat and I see some good discussion, um, but I don't think I see any specific questions. Um, but before I move towards closing, I'll just I'll just pause and see if anybody wants to ask Joanne or Dustin anything. Uh, oh, this is a fun question from Kathy. Uh, have you had issues with headlights and helmets? We haven't, and of course, being at public health, that's like number one. So we provide wipes and stuff for the helmets. Um, it will be nice to have more helmets than we actually need every single time, because if you have one class after the next, they do get sweaty. Probably that's a bigger issue than, um, especially when, with the summer programs. But, um, you know, we have the wipes that staff use like the first couple classes and then like they don't really ever use them after that. Um, but we haven't had any issues with them. And I know that there have been some some research about the fact that lice don't cling to plastic like that. Well, that's, that's good news. I see Kathy's had some uh, personal experience with lice over there. Um, but if anybody else has any other experiences uh, around lice, feel free to jump in the chat with that. Um, any other questions before we wrap up? Awkwardly long pause, my favorite, my favorite part of facilitating, the awkwardly long pause. Dave, you came off mute. Well, I was just coming in to help break up your awkwardly long pause a little bit. <laughs> <clears throat> I remember in the early, maybe this research came out since then, Joanne, but in the early days of managing bike fleets, um, we would use like those little surgeon caps for each of the kids that they would wear. Um, but man, that was definitely a hassle. Glad we can move on to solving other problems like rust and storage and moving things around. So. Um, well, thank you so much, Joanne and Dustin. Uh, that was that was really informative. I really appreciate all the work you put into that presentation. Um, I think so that we we end on time. I will uh, just spend a minute wrapping us up here if I can remember how to share my screen. Um, and I will also encourage folks. Uh, I think every presenter has shared their email. So if you have additional questions that occur to you later, uh, feel free to reach out to Joanne or to Dustin or to CJ or to Angela uh, or to Dave. <laughs> Um, you have everybody's emails. So um, just wanted to make a quick note. Uh, our next call is, uh, it's going to be March already somehow. Um, and we're going to talk about bike to school day, because that's going to be here before we know it. Um, calls are always the first Thursday of the month at 10am. Um, Julie sends out the reminders in the calendar invitation. So if you need those, um, feel free to let us know. And thank you all for joining us today. It was lovely to see you. Happy New Year. I know it's a little bit late for a happy new year, but it's the first time I've seen you all since the new year. Um, and looking forward to talking to you all again soon. Take care. <laughs>